and welcome to Kawasaki Political Society show. I'm your host, Marcus Rowland. Tonight we will be covering the recent shooting in the Thousand Oaks, uh, California, and whether or not there should be gun control measures implemented. We will also be looking into the new House of Representatives and the new Senate, uh, along with some analysis of the rest of the 2018 midterm elections. But first, some follow-up from our last episode, where we previously covered the mid uh, Massachusetts midterm elections the gubernatorial race, and ballot question one. Charlie Baker won by a very large margin of two-thirds of the vote. Elizabeth Warren also won with a large margin at 60% of the vote. All nine of the U.S. House of Representative seats from Massachusetts, as expected, went to Democrats. The results from the ballot questions were also no surprise. Question one was voted against, while both question two and three were passed. Now for the rest of the country where it is a mixed bag for both parties. The Democrats have retaken the House of Representatives, but the Republicans still maintain control in the Senate. Three seats were flipped by the Republicans. These seats were in Indiana, North Dakota, and Missouri. 25 House seats exchanged hands on Tuesday, November the 6th, with three states having three or more House seats exchanged from one party to the other, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Virginia. The Democrats have, uh, have one seat lead in the House and will make them and make most decisions fraught with controversy. At the same time, this may lead to more bipartisanship between both parties, as they will now be forced to work together. Nan Nancy Pelosi will have her work cut out for her as the new Speaker of the House. With the change in leadership, it will be interesting to see how the House votes on issues now. There is an ever-looming issue of the Mueller investigation and, the p and potential impeachment. Impeachment is voted upon by the House, now in control of the Democrats and the trial takes place in the Senate, which is still controlled by the Republicans. With the House controlled by Speaker Pelosi, it looks ever more likely that an impeachment trial uh, could come to fruition. The Mueller investigation has been quiet for some time, but with Jeff Sessions being forced to resign recently, things may once again be heating up. The Attorney General has skipped over uh, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, who is in charge of the Mueller investigation, and gone to Jeff Sessions' former Chief of Staff, Matthew Whitaker. I'd now like to bring in our panel for some discussions on the outcome of this election and the Mueller investigation in general. I'd now like to turn to our panel for some debate. On the left, we have Calder Frateroli and Nina Misosha. And on the right, we have Colin Slater and Matt Grimes. All right, I'd like to start off with a question about the election. Uh, does anybody want to uh, say anything about the, uh, the flip of the House? I do. Um, well, obviously the Democrats took the House by, I believe it was around 25 or 20, 27, I believe was the exact number for the amount of seats they took, which, I mean, it was pretty expected that they were going to take the House when the margin was pretty uh, close to what was expected. The, so the, what we saw, at least for the House, the polls were pretty correct. They, they were uh, wrong in a few states in the Senate, but for the House they were pretty correct. But. Uh, so the Democrats are going to have the House come January, I believe, is when the uh, next Congress meets. And uh, so uh, there was a lot of talk about impeaching Trump or um, investigating him. And I don't think that the Democrats are really going to do that because I think that they know that if they do repeat investigations, eventually voters are going to get tired of that and come 2020, um, even if they don't uh, re-elect President Trump, um, voters will um, be dissatisfied and the Democrats will lose the House once again. Go ahead. Can I something in? Um, so while I think that definitely the Democrats won't succeed in completely getting rid of Trump, I think a key um, motivation of theirs is to not only subpoena him, but start an impeachment process against him, knowing full well that he probably won't get impeached because they have a majority in the Senate, but sort of dragging that process out for as long as they can, spilling the dirt, getting whatever they can, throwing the dirt on his name, so to get him in an unpopular position for the 2020 election, where hopefully they can raise a candidate who will beat him. Well, I'm, I'm, well, first of all, to Calder's point that impeachment will hurt Trump, if you remember in, the 1998, in 1998, the Republican House impeached Bill Clinton, which did not succeed, and Bill Clinton actually came out more popular because of it. And also, if you think, if you think that this is a big check on Trump, if you think of Trump's top five biggest accomplishments in office, Tax Cuts and Job Act, Korean denuclearization, deglobalization, um, Space Council, some of these things, Israel, and um, hurting ISIS, 
and judicial appointments. How many of those things actually went through Congress? Only one of them. So, and also, since now the Democrats control the House, we're also going to start to see some more bipartisan issues come to the front of the burner, like uh, infrastructure, sensible immigration reform, and stuff like that. Well, I, I would uh, say that a concern for many about the House uh, flipping and the Senate remaining in the hands of the Republican is uh, a general lack of productivity by Congress. Well, I definitely think we're going to see gridlock because right now, just the way it works, the Democrats in the House and the Republicans in the Senate hate each other. They like I, I feel like I feel like right now the Democrats don't really have an agenda other than Trump is bad, orange man bad, but. Uh, <laughs> But, and then, like, the Republicans are actually trying to get things done, but the issue is now that they, now they can't. I think the claiming that we, or sorry, the Democrats, simply agenda is orange men bad is a little... <laughs> it's a joke, my friend. I understand it's a joke, but I think it's a little short-sighted. They obviously, we, sorry, oh my God, whatever. The Democrats have a plan to get rid of Trump. The Mueller investigation has not only resulted in countless um, arrests and uh, sentencing, sentencing, Saying is uh, sentences. Sentences. Sen is it sentences? Yes, sentences. I believe it is. We okay. need to cut this we, out. Um, they've sentenced many people. I mean, Manafort, Gates, uh, Papadopoulos. I think that the Democrats are going to try to use that sort of as the brunt of their uh, Democrat 2020 ticket of sort of this. Uh, the president is scandal ridden. He's basically immoral, corrupt, and I think they're going to want to use that. I sort of, the House is going to use that as sort of... Well, well, so what you're saying is you don't have a platform other than the president is yeah, bad. Yeah. I'm Orange man the bad. The platform is the, the fact that the president is, is immoral. But, so but that's what I said. Instead yes, of, that's the platform. Yeah. No, no, no. Guys, guys, he's right. Instead of just... No. Instead of just... But you just said no, he's no, right. Guys, instead of just yelling at each other and calling uh, other people names, um, we have to actually have some level of public discord on issues. We can't just label people and then not... Uh, t discuss anything. So, is there a general platform that the Democrats have? Um, I think that their general platform is obviously going to run off the. Well, I think everything basically relies on Trump, but simply saying that, oh, it's because Mueller was near sighted with me. I think the stuff like Medicare, immigration reform, the um, internment system on the southern border for the children, um, voting reform, I think. Uh, transgender rights. I think that many of these are hot topic issues that the Democrats are going to try to use to undermine Republican efforts to keep the 2020 Senate and keep the presidency. In well, I, uh, I'm going to stop you guys there because this is clearly a debate topic that could run on for uh, many, many days and months, and I, I'm sure it will no. in the House and the Senate. Um, but we, uh, we're going to pivot to our next topic now. Now for our second topic gun control, and the tragedy that occurred on November the 7th in Thousand Oaks, California. The shooter was armed with a 45 caliber handgun. The gun, while legal, had an extended magazine that made it more deadly. The extended magazine is illegal in the state of California. The shooter was a 28-year-old Marine veteran who the police had concerns surrounding his mental health. He was believed to have had PTSD. Among the 13 dead was a young man who survived the Las Vegas shooting. His name was Telemachus Orofranos. He was only 27. He had been in the line of fire in Las Vegas, enjoying a weekend away when that was ended by a mass shooting. He returned to his hometown afterwards, and he is now dead, killed in yet another mass shooting. Another victim of this tragedy is Ventura Sh Sheriff Sergeant Ron Hillis. He entered the active shooting scene in an attempt to stop the chaos. He later died at a local hospital. He is reported to have been outside on his phone to his wife when he heard the shooting and said, I love you, dear, before running inside. Many of the families of the victims are calling for greater gun control. Thousand Oaks is one of the safest communities in California and the nation as a whole. The simple fact is no matter where in the U.S. you live, shootings are becoming a regular part of everyday life. President Trump tweeted out later, I've been fully briefed on the terrible shooting in California. Law enforcement and first responders together with the FBI are on the scene. Thirteen people at this time have been reported dead. Likewise, the shooter is dead, along with the first police officer to enter the bar. Great bravery shown by the police. California Highway Patrol was on the scene within three minutes, with the first officer to enter, shot numerous times. The sheriff sergeant died in the hospital. God bless all of the victims and families of the victims. Thank you, law enforcement. 
President Trump has also called for flags to be put at half-mast, but he and other Republicans have not called for gun control. Different groups are calling for gun control. However, at, as time goes by, more and more of these shootings occur, it, became, it, it appears that society has become desensitized to them. So far, no large movement has occurred like after the Parkland sh school shooting. Gun control looks to remain to be a divisive topic in America. I'd now like to turn over to our panel to discuss gun control measures and the divide it has caused in America. I'd once again like to turn to our panel for some debate, this time on gun control. So I'd like to start off on the left here. Uh, what kind of gun control measures would you guys like to see? Um, I support, personally, I support increased background checks, but I don't really think hurt in any way any Americans. I understand the Second Amendment is created to like form a, I believe it's a well-regulated militia, which I don't really think is a necessity in modern America. I think that it's fine. I don't care if you want a gun, um, as long as you're not, as long as you've passed pretty intense background checks, I'm fine with owning a gun. I don't think, not for the banning of guns, the confiscation of guns, because I think that um, breaks American um, values, but like, I'm not, I'm for background checks. Uh, what do you see as an increased background check? Um, I think that some of the laws involving um, passing down of guns in families are a little bit um, too lenient. I think that you should go under, even in any way, if you're uh, uh, carrying a gun, you need to go through some the intense government back and forth. I think that Massachusetts' gun laws are very. Um, I think I their gun laws are pretty good. Um, it's that's about I think where the national standard should be, not Alabama's gun laws. Right. You like gun control measures and background checks, but what is like you said that you like the Massachusetts gun gun control laws, but like it would describe what those are and like, like do you even know them? I, I do, Colin. You have to go through some pretty intense background checks. It's a pretty long waiting period. There's government interviews, stuff like that, which I think that some states down south, I am aware, don't have. I think that a lot of the western states don't have. Um, to, uh, to, to pivot the debate slightly, um, do, you, do you guys think that the uh, police, uh, as a proposed measure, uh, should have the ability to uh, take guns away from people if they're a, a potential danger to others or themselves? Well, it, no. That would violate the Second Amendment. But, the Second but, Amendment says you have a right to own a firearm that has not been previously banned and you can own any military level firearm that has not been previously banned. That was the DC versus Heller decision, which probably Calder is not aware of, but it does exist. You do have a right to own a firearm. You're saying someone is a schizophrenic with a history of You have a right to own a paranoid, firearm that is not paranoid mental banned. disorders. They should be allowed to own an AR-15 AR rifle. Do you rifle. know what DC versus Heller is? You just stated it. Can you state it back to me so I understand that you have that knowledge? I don't have that knowledge, Matt. I don't Correct. Care. I don't care what it is. You it's don't a, care about the Constitution. It's illogical to own an assault rifle if you're a schizophrenic or a psychopath. No, it isn't. How do yes, you define it, that? Can you define the that as medical, anything you want? What? If, uh, if you have a diagnosed mental disorder, I do not, that is severe and light and We dangerous. need to have the Second Amendment. We need to have citizens owning assault rifles to keep the government in check to protect the checks and balances of the Constitution. Without it, I, I, without it, the, the Constitution well, is just a pinky promise. Well, I think with the the whole the what he said about the like Eric Calder, so I'm sorry about the uh, you don't want people who are mentally ill having guns. The issue is that some states would abuse some. Let's be frank here. Left leaning states would abuse that because they don't want as many guns out there as anyone with something as simple as ADHD can own a gun. Can own a gun. Yes, I know it wouldn't but, start off like that, but it would it would very quickly grow to that. And do, do you honestly think people with ADHD are going to like be predisposed to go and no, kill people? But I mean, I, where's the harm in like taking away more guns besides violating the Second Amendment? I mean, I'm pretty sure the Constitution once like allowed slavery. So and like. So where does the Constitution free, allow slavery? People. I'm just confused. Well, they took it out. Like they where, it where, did, where in the Constitution does it say you can't have slaves? 15th Amendment, maybe? Yeah, but where in the Constitution does it say you could have slaves? I believe it was the 15th Amendment. Right, the 15th could. Amendment, which allowed black men to vote. The Constitution before the 15th Amendment, I believe, allowed you to have slaves? Yeah, yeah. but the, the Constitution never explicitly yeah. outlined also, the right to I own really slavery. I really don't believe people in the United would, States. who had ADHD would have, I don't really don't believe people would violate violate the Second Amendment to take away guns from people who have ADHD rather than people who are a psychopath have had a history of violence and I just really well, don't think see, people would abuse see, that no, to I, the extent. I, I, see, it, it would be used as a loophole because a lot of places 
want, and uh, like states and to a more local extent cities that want to have guns banned would use that as a loophole to try to get as many guns out of the hands of citizens as they could. Yeah, but I think that saying, oh, we shouldn't do it because it could harm people with like ADHD is the same as saying, oh, we shouldn't ban murder because if someone kills your daughter, revenge killing is still okay. Like, I feel like it's very... My, obviously, murder is a bit more than only a gun. Right. But I think that saying this could happen, so we should ban it altogether, is kind of illogical. It's like saying, "Oh, someone was shot by a woman." That means that no women should have gun rights. It's like. I I think the important thing to keep in mind, though, is it's not a hypothetical about the debate isn't about what could happen, it's about what has happened. So it, it, recently, like a week and a half ago, the uh, 13 people were killed in a shooting in uh, Thousand Oaks, California. Um, and it wasn't by an assault rifle, it was by a uh, handgun with an illegally oversized clip. So it really does bring into question at what level is a uh, gun control measures would it even be effective. So. Also, might I just add to the borderline shooting, one of the victims was a 27-year-old Navy vet, and he was also in the Las Vegas shooting, and I don't believe in any other country there would probably be someone yeah. who was in two mass shootings and survived one, but died in the other. I think that we can point out the Thousand Oaks shooting as, oh, he had an illegally sized clip, therefore, you know, no, don't need regulations because people go around them. I think if we look at, say, the Pittsburgh shooting or the, um, uh, Parkland shooting or the um, Sutherland Spring shooting, we can point out there's a history of people legally owning guns that use them for horrific means. And I think that saying, okay, but in this one, someone had a gun that was illegal, is like saying, oh, there have been 150 car accidents this year. Five of them were um, from stolen cars, so that means that um, we shouldn't enforce more regulations. It's kind of illogical and it seems a little pointless. Well, you mentioned Parkland and Las Vegas, and a common issue with those shooters and other shoot uh, in shooters in, um, with uh, I'm sorry um, with shooters and other shootings that I didn't just mention. Many of them were mentally ill, or if they weren't mentally ill, they they was found out that oh yeah they were after they died, and it it really shows the. Uh, Lack of strength in the in being able to detect mental illness in people. It's not an issue of some people are going to be mentally ill, therefore restrict all guns. I think it's an issue of we need to be able to better detect who is mentally ill and stop them from owning firearms. I'm not against them. In fact, that's what I was advocating earlier. But I think like Dylan Roof, the Charleston Church shooter, and Nicholas Cruz, the Parkland shooter, yes, both had a previous history of diagnosed mental illnesses by therapists, and I think. I, I don't, Dylan Roof actually um, committed his shooting with a pistol, so it's a different player, but they were both able to legally acquire these guns, which I think points to the fact that the gun regulations, both these shootings happened in the South. Um, so, uh, is Charleston in North Carolina or South Carolina? Uh, South Carolina, please. South Carolina, one of these shootings in South Carolina and others in Texas, or sorry, not Texas, Florida. Um, I think that in the South, I'm not being biased, but the South is definitely has a more conservative lean. It's down there where we need to be more aware of mental health issues and the regulations among, uh, among guns and mental health issues as of like in the north obviously we still have mass shootings and they're still horrific. Um, of course. Sandy Hook was a horrific tragedy in the nation but I think that there's a, if you look at the maps, there's a definite swing towards states with more lax gun control regulation. Well, uh, as interesting as this debate has become, we are uh, sadly out of time. So uh, we will move into our third topic now. To close out this episode, we now turn to Germany, where recently the Chancellor Angela Merkel has announced that she will no longer be re uh, seeking re-election. Angela Merkel became Chancellor in 2005, and she has dominated European the politics since. Her term is to carry through to 2021. The Doctor of Chemistry states she currently has no future interest in politics. This leaves the leadership of the European Union mostly in the hands of Emmanuel Macron the French president. Given the current state of Britain and the ongoing Brexit situation, Misha Trey is out for the leadership of Europe. For the time being, however, do not count Merkel out. She is still very much the Chancellor and very much the leader of the European Union. It will be very interesting to see who fills her slot, whether it is another member of the Christian Democrats, a member of the current coalition government, or a member of the opposition party. That's all the time we have for. I'm Marcus Rowland, and I will see you again next time. Thank you.